Yeah, I'm Neil Pfeiffer. I'm from Wichita, Kansas. Uh, I'm an officer in the Vintage Sailplane Association, and I'm the drawing archivist for the Vintage Sailplane Association. So for home builders and such, we have various plans that I've taken and digitally scanned and then cleaned with uh, uh, Photoshop. Uh, the schedule shows concepts for a touring motor glider, and uh, this is going to be a high level to go look through it. Okay, why would we consider it a, a touring motor glider? Rob, why do you consider it? Why do you consider it? Uh, okay. It's hard to find a crew. Okay. Yeah. And uh, cost of tow. Yeah, but it allows you to get aloft any time the weather really permits, okay, and your schedule. You can do those sunrise or sunset type flights and be back and just have it make it easy. Uh, you can, I uh, know one uh, lady here with, that was here last year, uh, Sonia, she, she had her motor glider so she could get to a, uh, a soaring location a little bit more remote from where her airfield was. Um, and it, it also gives you that ability to make a day trip or even a little longer. And then why home built? Well, it challenge and owner pride and affordable to make and maintain. And in doing that though, if you're doing home builds, it's best to have a realistic schedule that can be defined. And even if it's a retirement project, the schedule is good as a goal. Um, but you gotta realize that it's not necessarily gonna be a firm schedule for most home builders, but you work within your constraints. Um, but the design, my take on this and where I'm really pushing the talk is, it can extend, you have to have a design that will extend your years in the, in the cockpit. You want something that has good ergonomics, it's easy to maintain, and, and, keep, and keep it in service. Um, the basic design requirements, L over D isn't everything. Uh, you trade that off with your speed and range for touring and your payload, okay? Uh, good ergonomics, ease of e ingress and egress. Uh, yeah, we'll go into that later. Comfortable cockpit once you're in. Good control harmony and reasonable forces. You don't want it absolutely too light, but you don't want it really heavy or anything. You don't, and you want it to be good pitch and uh, roll, nice harmony. Good visibility. Uh, and then the simplicity of design. Uh, you want it buildable in a reasonable length of time and at a, at a low or at least lower initial cost. And easy, uh, make it for easier inspections and maintenance. In single seat existing uh, touring motor gliders, the ASK 14 in the upper left and this is a picture from a month ago in Holland where they had 11 of those gliders all together for a, uh, their meet, and they're still very active over there, okay? Uh, Dean Gradwell has one in uh, uh, Montague. Uh, I have two in my workshop right now and uh, that I'm trying to restore. And Steve Leonard has one that uh, the fuselage was restored, but the wings need to be recovered. Okay, so you've got wood up there, all wood. You've got wood and uh, steel tube with the RF4. You've got aluminum with the Moni. And then you have the Karat down here, which uh, is all composite. So you've got a full range of materials and uh, designs and performance here. If you look at two seat uh, uh, touring water gliders, the, the wood and steel tube construction, so steel tube and fabric fuselages with wood wings. The ASK-16, they made uh, a small number of those. 
of the RF5. Uh, Steve Erickson, who lives down the hill, I think has one of those and has had it up here for vintage meets and such. Uh, the Shiva SF25 here in the bottom. And uh, that was also built under license by Slingsby as a T61. And there's ranges of it uh, going from uh, a Shamo 1500cc engine up through um, uh, the road taxes and such going over 100 cores. Um, then you have the existing sheet metal construction, the Xenos, like Pete Buck has over here, and then the uh, uh, Vivat out of the Czech Republic. And then when you get into composites, and I'm sorry if I let your favorite one out, okay, but there's enough here. I just, the Demona, the Tycoon, the Grove 109s, the Jamago, the Lombada, and all of these aircraft that have shown this far are all low wing aircraft, with the exception of Pipistro. They're in the middle, okay? They have, these motor gliders have L over Ds that range somewhere around 24 to maybe 31 to 1. Uh, cruise speeds from 70 to over 110 knots. Ranges of three to 400 miles are pretty common, but there is at least one of these that you can fly over 700 nautical miles, okay? Or 700 miles, statute miles, sorry. And then prices range from $6,000 for uh, a project in reasonable condition to over 200,000 for a, a really well-equipped new one, okay? Materials for home building, wood. Uh, Part, wood's readily available for the most part. Parts count is still probably going to be a little bit higher uh, when you do build with wood. But you can use traditional hand and power tools. Uh, although, if you were going to do a kit and wanted to have you do CAD aided design and such on it, you could use a CNC router and there's enough places that can do that for you that you could have all your uh, ribs and frames and such cut, pre-cut. Modern adhesives now are easy to mix and they're pretty forgiving in that you, they don't require the absolute tight, 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 you know, to thousands of an inch fit on everything and then very high uh, clamping pressures to hold it together. The epoxies with the uh, cotton flocks or other uh, structural fibers in it and such uh, allow you to have some gap filling and be able to do it very nicely. The surface finish can be as good as the builder's expertise. For steel tubing, it's strong, it's light, and it's crash resistant. You've got a lot of airplanes that people walk away from uh, after the, they've hit something and the tubes are bent up, but the person isn't. Uh, it requires welding, and that really is a special, specialized skill for thin wall tubing. Um, and that's why some of these places uh, that build the knockoff Cubs, J3 Cubs and such, you can buy a pre-welded fuselage and have that. Okay. And then they're covered with lightweight fabric, and there's some low volatility uh, fabric options, so waterborne systems like Stewart, uh, and there's even a pre finish option here um, out of Germany. Or in Germany. Yeah. Um, and you can make it square and simple, or you can, with your steel tube, you can put a few long uh, stringers on it and get a little bit of a curve in everything and make it rounded for aesthetics. Um, sheet metal. Tooling for a one off is pretty difficult. Um, you got to really want to do that to, to hand form ribs and then take them and have them uh, heat treated, get soft material, bend them, heat treat them, do everything. Um, but pre-cut and punched kits really do make it easy. 
uh, if you can find a kit. Uh, corrosion protection really should be considered on these because uh, you don't know where the thing's going to live for its life. And then a, a, you can have a mix of bonded, bonding pieces together and riveting system, depending on the design. Uh, good surface finish can be achieved with all of these too. Composites, they're really labor intensive for a one-off. If you tried to do the old rutan thing by foam blocking it and then putting your, uh, your fabric and your resin on top of that and the fillers and all the other stuff and all the hand sanding and every, they get very labor intensive. So they're really most likely only going to be for if you had a kit was available. And, uh, and that requires molds for either kits or rate production. And, but it has the benefit that if you get to that level, you can dramatically cut your cart, cart down because if you do sandwich skins, you don't need many ribs or spars or whatever. So you can cut that down. Your workshop environment, though, will need some better temperature control than you would probably need with the metal or the wood. Uh, but you can get really nice surface finish with these. So in general summary, wood's pretty easy to use, but will require, require more craftsmanship. The sheet metal and composites, composites are viable if you can find a kit, okay? Uh, and any of these materials really provide acceptable surface quality, structural strength, and long-term robustness. So, what, what would uh, a general cross-section want for the requirements for a uh, touring motor glider? Um, I've assumed at the outset that probably, if you're looking at doing a little bit of touring, you probably want two seats. Uh, and side by side is also generally assumed. Um, the RF5 has a tandem and there's a few others, but the side by side seems to be preferred. Uh, access and in other than a cockpit must be good. In fact, I'd say you really ought to aim for excellent. Uh, max L over D, somewhere around 30 to 1, although if you could push it a little bit higher, it'd be nice. Uh, but I think at 30 to 1, you have a, a, a reasonable touring glider, okay? Um, range of greater than 400 nautical miles with cruise speed over 90 knots would be, uh, I think, a pretty good basic goal. Uh, control harmony must good, be good. Low speed characteristics must be docile. You want it to work well in the pattern and uh, when the accidents are, are higher probability. And then it should be buildable with minimum assembly tools. You don't want lots of big fixtures you have to have in your shop to do things. Um, the design should allow parts to be made with automation, um, whether it's metal or wood or whatever. Um, and that uh, and even in composites, you'd like to, if you were going to go from scratch, you'd like to NC cut molds and do things like that. Um, it should have adequate performance for high hot conditions. And saying throughout here, it'd be nice to have a good 300 feet a minute on a hot day, at least. And then assume a gas powered engine would be utilized. Um, but it could change over uh, in the future. And uh, I've got at the bottom the discussion, what am I missing? Uh, are there any comments or things that, things that stick out to you in the audience? Yeah. Do you see anything like 3D printing coming where it gets refined enough that you could I think that's probably going to be uh, price prohibitive for, for where we want to be going. 
I could see it. I, I had uh, inlet sleeves printed for a, a earth engine that's obsolete uh, to go between the carburetor and the cylinders. And so I had those scanned, made into CAD models, and then had them 3D printed with carbon filled the nylon. And that sort of a thing, or if you had a small fitting or something else, uh, James Weedy with e uh did uh, fittings for where tubes came together, other things. He would uh, cut them out on a little NC uh, router and such, or an NC mill. <coughs> and uh, there's ways to put that sort of thing in, but I don't think full 3D printing except for smaller parts, probably. Yeah? You know, it's nice to fit in a 40-foot hanger. Does that mean detachable wingtips of some sort? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> so, that's, a good one. that's a really good one. Yeah. The, the Pipiscal is a good example of one that doesn't do that. Well, they have the, it, it depends. They have one version that has removable tips, and you can put, uh, you can put short tips on it or long tips on it. And then they have another one that I think just has a 15 meter weight. Yeah. The, that was the one that I was looking at. Fit it in the hair. Well, it's taking a bit of wings now, huh? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Also, the, the Spartan stop and feathering of the, the engine. Oh. Yeah, okay. Feathering the propeller. Right. If you have a, like a turtle bed, you know, how, how much altitude do you have to have oh, yeah. you start that? Well, what I'm assuming in the, 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 the photos I showed were all uh, right. in the nose, okay? Uh, there are a few that were behind and such, but I'm assuming that the propeller is out at all time. Uh, in ASK-14, there's a, a T-handle on the panel. You pull, turn, and lock the full <coughs> feather. Uh, you know, kind of on that same bit, is on the engine, I flew a crack quite a bit in the Elliott Basin, and it was, um, with the Volkswagen engine air-cooled, it was very hard sometimes to get the altitude that I needed to be in for the various class airspaces that I was trying to fly around without overheating the engine. Okay. Because it didn't have a lot of climb rate. Um, then once I would get to that altitude, it was really hard to get it to get cooled back down again. So you end up throttling way back and just allow it to just, but I wasn't really at the altitude I wanted to be at either. So I would end up doing a lot of cruise, uh, climb. cruise climbing and, and struggling with the um, the temperature obviously it was tightly cowled because you don't want all of it to drag right. and things like that. That's why I really like what Sonia did on hers. Okay. She, where she had essentially cow flaps right. in the inlets. Okay. It got a lot better. So that was good. Um, I never, your comment on the feathering prop, the feathering prop I think is a much better way to go than that folding mm -hmm. thing that they had in the crack. It, it never worked right. You okay. know, always have to slow it down, stall it practically, and, and it would get to about here. Oh, you know, then you speed up again and no, no, no. <laughs> so, it, it, and, I don't know, it was tough. A lot of, and a lot of times we just get hung up. You have to bump the starter to get it out to get it okay. back all the way again. So, the prop, I would suggest would be to stick with, with feathering. Yeah. Around. And there's alternatives there with and drag, and MT yeah. and such. Yeah. But the, uh, now I filmed the uh, Stenny's quite a bit as well, or a little bit. Not yeah. Not as much as I did the Having, and the Raj Jumango I flown in that one time, and having a, a water-cooled engine, big difference, much okay. nicer. Especially for the cooling down, the time you have to have cooling it down before you shut it down, okay. uh, those kinds of things. Even mine, the 31, is nicer with being water-cooled, I still have to go through a cool period. Okay. Not due to the engine, that's something else, but, right. yeah. but um, those are considerations that you might want to put in here. 300 feet per minute is probably a little out of the way inside. Yeah. Okay. 500 is what I would say would be minimal. Even high hot. Yeah. Okay. And uh, last week, my, I saw what my glider does last week. We had a real rough uh, south wind here, which was creating uh, quite a bit of uh, turbulence, uh, turbulence. And I had a little bit of a yeah. excitement at the end of the runway. Okay. <laughs> They're full power, and we're not going where I want to go. Yeah. <laughs> So, okay. more, than, more is better. Okay. Dan, what's your normal climb rate out of here? Like if it's just an average. I usually do about five, six hundred feet a minute. So five, six knots. 
I can do just about as good as a tow plane. If, 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 when I take off right behind a tow plane, we go to the bald spot. I'm behind them, um, mostly because I'm trying to stay out of their way. But I'm about the same altitude, pretty close. It's about the same, maybe a little bit longer. Uh, Honey does a pretty good job of climbing compared to 56 horsepower self launcher. And, and, and Neil, it's probably a good idea explicitly to go on any requirements put down a price and a build time. Because price sensitivity, I'm actually willing to live with much lower L over D if you give me a really cheap glider. Okay. You know, so. Okay, trade offs that way. Yes, sir. Uh, trailer ability. Yeah. Some will want it, some won't want it. Yeah. Uh, and within that is foldable versus disassemble and put on the train. Okay. Well, well, having both is uh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> the cross country and trailer bolt is nice. I did like that on the correct. That was yeah. nice. Okay. Yeah. Neil? Yes. Uh, have you have you considered in any of this the concept of of trying to create essentially a longer or a soaring wing upgrade for existing powered aircraft that meet most of those uh, points other than the glide ratio? For example, making a longer wing on a tailor craft or you know a, or a home built or something that meets. The majority of this, it would shorten the time. Not exactly that, but you'll see. <laughs> Accessibility. We're not getting any younger, okay? Nobody is. And how much effort is required to get in and out of a typical powered aircraft without an air stair, okay? Um, and then you use a step to get onto the wing of a low wing airplane, okay? And then you, or you use a step to get to the door of most high wing airplanes, okay? And is that step a little tiny step that you have to kind of balance on a little bit? And, and once you get on the wing, is that a pretty narrow walkway you're working on and everything? And then once you get up onto the wing there, do you still have a sill to step over? And uh, you have to step uh, onto the seat in order to reliably get in and out? Uh, and do you have to find a handhold to keep balance while you're doing all of this? And now you get all in and then you go, how in the hell do I get out? <laughs> okay. I mean, I helped. Um, a fella that's in our age group, okay, get out of a 233 the other day, and he's trying to figure out which foot, which, you know, all the other stuff, and he's just taking a ride, okay, and he's trying to step out, he's on the seat, and he's trying to put a foot onto this, and I just walked over and said, put your hand here, just use me to stabilize yourself, don't worry about the plane, okay. And finally, we got him out of the glider, okay? It's, we're not all 25. And it, it really affects uh, how people are going to be able, how often they'll use their aircraft if they can't get in and out of them easily. So it should come with a yoga program also, I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hey, yoga's hard. <laughs> okay, so in thoughts of that, a, a high wing airplane, could we consider a high wing one, similar to a pipistrel, okay, to offer improved access into the cockpit? And let's consider a Whitman tailwind, okay? And uh, the door sill height is low. It's kind of parallel to the ground. You don't really climb up and in the Taylor, uh, into the, not Taylor Craft, the Whitman, okay, the tailwind. You get up to buy it, you turn, you put your seat on the, on the door sill there, and you bend your knees, lift your legs, and kind of rotate and slide into the seat and your, and your feet into the whole cockpit, okay? And 
I was at Oshkosh. I hadn't really thought about this, but at Oshkosh, I was at a forum for the Tailwinds, I don't know, three, four years ago. This lady uh, gave a talk, and she was middle-aged, and she was not small. She was good, good size, and she said her mother was in her mid-80s and was using a walker now to get around a lot of places, okay? But she wanted to drive, go fly. She wanted to go travel home to, from Central Texas to Central Valley of California to visit friends and relatives that uh, she had there. That, and that may be the last trip she'd make back to see all these friends. And so they started figuring out the stages to get through this airport and that airport and the connection up here and then finally into the small airport near where they wanted to go. And at that point, they, uh, she started figuring out all of the logistics and how long the time and the distance they were going to have, her mother was going to have to traverse. And she instead got her to come to the hangar and look at the tailwind and they figured out that she could come up to with the walker, get on up there, and get on up and in the airplane adequately. They could put her walker in, their bags, and they flew to from Central Texas to Flagstaff, landed, taxi up next to the FBO, go in, have a little rest period there, check up with fuel, and then uh, go ahead and make the next trip over into the Central Valley right to where they wanted to be. He said what made it possible was the accessibility that the plane offered. You must have under six foot tall. <laughs> well, yeah, but, uh, but uh, Mike, uh, uh, Mike uh, Longback in Wichita, who had his uh, tailwind on the uh, uh, cover of EA magazines over six feet tall, okay? And it, there, there, may, there must be a happy medium to get to. And, and even if it involved putting a small uh, block, a lightweight composite block down or something for a step, and a, a pull string to put it up and put it in the back or something, there ought to be ways to get the accessibility where people can get in and out. Yes, sir. One of the things that might help with that, I used to, for a fun car, I used to have an MG Midget. Yeah. And that's how you get into it. You sit down and then you turn. Yeah. But the door is not very wide front to back. Yeah. So you still have to be pretty flexible in this, right. this kind of thing. Um, and the Midget, it wouldn't be possible, there wasn't room. But in an airplane, that you're, if you're designing it, perhaps a seat that would move back while you're loading and move back forward. Okay. Yeah, I tried getting into Whitman one time. I did, did not work well at all. I got in it eventually, but it was tough. Okay. Because it's what you're just talking about. I could not put my butt in and get my legs in. I put my legs okay. in first and, and somehow get in. Well, and there was a, a, a Clemens, then uh, a friend of Whitman up there in Wisconsin, designed it change the tubes in that the back of the door area okay. and uh, where the seat and all that came together and most everybody now the W10s all have that included in it. The other thing I didn't like about um, the hip stool was that with the high wing configuration it looked to me to be a death trap in the thermal. Mm -hmm. The visibility is terrible. Absolutely terrible. Okay. The it is so small that in that one, my head was actually up into the root of the wing, mm -hmm. pumping on the okay. pumping on the skylight above me, which you know I really can't see. The skylight is pretty it. small in that. It area. is. It's really small. And then of course, limited forward visibility. It just scared me to just think of fumbling with anybody okay. with that. Thoughts for visibility. Yeah. <laughs> Thermally, okay. Yeah. yeah. You, you need to be able to initiate your turn to clear the area, and you need to be able to maintain, maintain that vision while you're in it, okay? And so, almost all the, the Turing motor gliders are low wing. You do have the Pipistro with that. I have not flown a Pipistro, okay? So, the eye and the head position are going to be all important 
in whether this all works well or not, okay, for a high wing. Uh, transparencies, does, I don't know how far the transparency came back. The tailwinds carry the transparency back, and they have those cutouts in the side of the, to try to minimize uh, your blockage on the forward vision. I don't like the, the cutbacks, but, uh, but then, and, uh, if you can have it above, good visibility up up here above, when you're established in the turn, you should be able to see around, okay? Uh, and then forward sweep. Uh, most two-seat two gliders have a fair amount of forward sweep in the inboard wing because they want to, even if it's a tandem, you, they want to keep your CG control, okay? And so if you can get the, the roots <coughs> back to here, that you can actually see out, then you have a good chance of making the whole thing work well, okay? And like uh, the Olympias, you're really sitting back at the wing root in it, and the, uh, the wings are scarfed <coughs> on either side, and you have transparency that forms the wing leading edge in that region so that you actually are looking out through what would be wing when you're sitting in the glider. There are some ways to deal with that. <coughs> Concept one, uh, a sheet metal uh, glider, the Xenos. It's really, Pete Buck here is probably your expert, okay, on this. But it's, it's a nice sheet metal kit. Uh, although some people would like to build from scratch, I think the Xenos makes a lot of sense. Um, you've got, you know what your cost is, you know essentially what your schedule could be to do that, um, and considerable engineering has been expended to, to make the kit. Pete tested out lots of things, they, they got it all set up, and uh, it appears to be a quality kit. The company's well established, and it's primarily an assembly operation so that you're, you have pre-manufactured parts that fit together, okay? Uh, for composite, the only kit that I've been able to find was the Europa. Um, and it's not real, been very popular here in the United States per se, but there is a long wing version of this uh, airplane. And so, and there's both, the long wing typically runs the mono wheel with the outriggers as opposed to putting a, a pair of wheels on it. Concept three, say enlarging, since it's going to two seats, enlarging the K-14 concept. Uh, you could, uh, ribs, and frames could be NC cut from plywood instead of building them out of hundreds of sticks, okay? And the wood or composite carbon fiber uh, spar caps, you could use, you know, reinforce or completely replace with, with composite spar caps to make them easier. Then you don't have to select spruce and, or kefir or anything else. Um, or, it, the, the German stuff, there is available unidirectional laminated beach, which is very strong and would make excellent spar cap material. Uh, simple assembly fixtures could also be uh, NC cut, and Baltic birch plywood could be used to skin major portions of the wing. That's fairly readily available. Or, uh, Dan wanted me to include uh, that also strips of thin lumber or plywood could be used to do the complex curves in places. Uh, fabric then would, could be used for open bays and, and that's pretty standard operation. But it would need an all new design and uh, the finish and can be high quality and it's dependent on the builder's ability. <clears throat> I 
I got two of these? Concept four um, is steel tubing fuselage with wood wings. The wood wings like in the previous concept. Um, but the fuselage fabricated from steel tubing. Um, wood stringers you could add to, to make the fabric go out and around it. Um, but with steel tubing fuselages, you really want to try to figure out how to make it overly complex so that getting a simple pre-welded fuselage could be made much easier. Um, I worked on a version of a peat and pole that had a steel tubing fuselage, and they're pretty easy. There's not lots of complexity. You start looking when you get lots and lots of things and you're trying to make it the absolute lightest thing, um, you end up adding a lot of complexity. And if you made it just a little simpler and accepted just maybe a little bit more weight, it may be nicer. Or use the, the battens, the, the stringers to go ahead and get your shape on it. I don't know why I'm... Okay. Uh, so I'm thinking in terms of a kit version of a, a Super Shiba or similar. Uh, uh, the um, wings would be similar to Concept 3. Fuselage, steel tubing. Uh, and it requires experience with thin wall tubing, welding. The suggested concept that I'm going here would be to consider a high wing uh, to provide good access to the cockpit, mid, a mild forward wing sweep to try to deal with the any uh, visibility in there, okay? Fixed gear legs with streamlined struts and wheel pants uh, for simplicity and cost. You could consider a mono wheel with outriggers, but I think that when you got through and figured it all out, you might be as light and as it, it gets overly complex with outriggers if you want them to come up and do things. It might be just as easy to do, put the fixed gear down. Um, it's wooden steel tube construction for a single or a few aircraft if you really um, and then the wood spars could use uh, unidirectional carbon uh, for reinforcement if there was enough interest CNC cut molds and composite layups would be positive possible but I don't think you probably initially would be able to get enough interest to do that and then include a flap in the design um, so that you can minimize drag over a range of air speeds and CL. And I'd use a custom uh, laminar flow airfoil, and my choice would be a, a, the slotted natural laminar flow airfoil. And so this was just a quick taking a basic view of a a tailwind, okay, uh, W10. I haven't extended it. It could be stretched or done a little bit more to do whatever. But putting the wing, essentially, I pushed the roof up a bit on the tailwind so that the, uh, and this is a considerably thicker airfoil than a tailwind has, and it's uh, similar to the slotted airfoils that I've been working on. And, uh, and then massaging the door shape and trying to get it to where it uh, gives you the access. And then taking a wing and, and bringing it so that it sweeps forward on the inner panel where you have the flap. And then in the aileron region, it kicks back and comes back. And this is uh, actually very standard to like if you look at the Schleicher uh, 32s and uh, the, the uh, Schemperth gliders, the Arcas, 
the others. Um, so, and then I make a, a fairly simple tail like a, an ASK-14 or a K-6E that utilizes um, an all-flying tail. And uh, from there. Now, all that was talking about two seat. If you Google JT10 motor glider out there too, there is uh, a fella I think in Finland who had been uh, looking at various concepts. They're only concept at this stage, but I think it is a kind of a neat look at the start, okay? And it, it provides you. Um, this is not an expensive type aircraft to build, okay? So if, if, it, if a single seat was of interest, I think that that's fairly reasonable. You know, Neil, that reminds me of one thing that um, I really like about the Karat. It had conventional landing gear. Yeah. I could taxi it around a, a normal airport, even mm -hmm. with a narrow airport with a lot of signage. Yeah. At 50 foot, you know, 50 foot, uh, 50 meter span, it was tough in a lot of areas. So you can see fly out of there. It's pretty narrow. And um, that's where the model where you're going to definitely need outriggers. Right. Know? But even then, you know, you don't always have the width for that outrigger. You know? Right. So uh, taxi ability uh, at a normal airport. And having one, what I wish the character for that would have had would have been uh, differential braking. Or could lock on the wheel and spun it around. Okay. You know, the tighter, a tighter radius than right. what you could do with just a steerable tail. Can't do that with a mono wheel. <laughs> <laughs> well, you can. It's just bump it around and get up there. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, sir. Uh, the, the same designer, Turbomaki, uh, has something called a JT8, which is a pusher configuration, uh, but along the same lines of the same designer, same type of yeah. renderings. And that is also a potentially viable way to do it. It, it. That goes back to the Alex Strojnik right. way of doing it. But that's also a, an equally valid thing. But that's a custom, you know, uh, built airplane that's right. no longer based on a, like a tailwind yeah, or something. The, for a single seat, you may be able to get by with uh, the, the rear uh, propeller. Mm -hmm. When you get to two seats wide, like the Icons mm -hmm. and the others, it's really difficult to get pressure recovery yeah. 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 Uh, into that into the cord length of the wing. Yeah. It it just you got to do some active flow control or something yeah. to get it to really work right. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yes. You see technology that just been uh, fairly developed down in Texas that uh, is going to revolutionize propulsion through a new design electric motor kind of generator. Yeah, the, the electric motors are, are not the trouble, it's the batteries. I'm, I've no, yet I'm doing to... a diesel electric. Oh, okay. Hybrid. Well, I've got a slight, if... Uh, We've had discussion throughout this. Let me put this up. And speaking of single seat motor gliders, I have two in my shop right now. And I'm picking up a trailer here to take back for one of them. So thank you, Rick. So. Uh, this is an ASK-14 picture taken at uh, um, Elmira in 2004 or 5, somewhere there. And this is uh, glider now resides at Montague. And uh, so, and it's serial number it's a 14, serial number 47. This is a glider that I picked up a few years ago with two partners and it looks worse than it is but you know, it was in an earthen floor hangar at Lovettsville in uh, Virginia and it's serial number four and here is one that I picked up three years ago out of the blue at uh, Palo Alto Airport and the best thing to note is 
the decay in the wood here and the fresh wood that I had to screw to the front and recut the opening for the door in the front because the front was delaminating on this wooden trailer. I ended up just putting a piece of plywood over the front and screwing it to cover it. That was my door to get it home. Uh, and I ended up doing major work on it. When I got it back to Wichita, I found out I did have an entire glider. I have started taking off paint on the fuselage a little bit there, but I decided that a friend said, you need to get a picture of it together to take to the FAA. So I did that. So this is like the fuselage when I got it. You can see the fuselage from the other one in my home built uh, ring. Okay, we're back. So this is the, uh, you can make that uh, fuselage ring out of one 4x4 four four sheet of, of three quarter inch plywood. Uh, and the base comes out of the leftover. So, and then on the right is pretty much the current stand where I'm at right now with them. Uh, fuselage preparation, uh, a dual action sander with a good vacuum, and I started with a belt sander. I started with a belt sander because that's how thick the film was on the nose. And you, but then you realize that the cowl comes back to here, and so they didn't have a step to let the cow fit in. They just filled it with filler behind. Oh. And I think they filled it so thick with filler that they'd only need to do one application and just smoothed it out, okay? <laughs> and cool too. So, <laughs> so, so this is, you know, after uh, 20 minutes of sanding, and that's after about a day of sanding, okay? get everything off of it. Uh, the one on the other side, I did similar. I didn't take it down quite as far, but nearly. And then I came back on the front by putting half inch wide, two millimeter thick plywood strips about six inches long and glued them in place at the front to be the step for the cowl to match it. And then I used the West Epoxy and Microlite behind it to fill that all in, to bring it up to uh, smooth the contour. And instead of doing one application, I did probably six or eight applications, the sanding in between, so I have kind of the minimum weight installation. And that shows what you end up with then with that. I'm going to put 2.4 ounce uh, fiberglass with West Epoxy over the top. Uh, if you get lighter than about 2 ounce. Uh, yeah, thick cloth. Did, did you weigh it after it was stripped just for a data point? No. Okay. <laughs> uh, but I could weigh this one here where it is with just this filler before I put the fiberglass on. Okay. Um, and. Uh, but I don't want to ever repaint these ever again. <laughs> so I'm going to put the light modeler's type fiberglass on the outside, and I seal it with a squeegee, the epoxy through it, and then as it's just going to soap stage, I go ahead and take micro light and squeegee that with uh, thin epoxy over it, and let it fill the weave. So I just, when I sand it, it just sands very easy. Um, the AF, the 14 engines, that's 47. Four, oh, that's ball, ball, as some of you may know from old vintage gliders. And the Jim Short, Dave Schur, and I bought the glider from Bob. And, uh, and then this one here looks a little bit scroungy on the outside because it had condensation, but I looked, I boroscoped the inside, and the engine looks good. So, but then you've got to deal with all these linkages 
and four carburetors, four cylinder geared, a two cycle, okay? 26 horsepower. Four ignitions too. Four ignitions. Oh yeah, there's four coils to it. Yeah. Yeah, and two sets of points back here on the magneto, and it, it fires bang, bang, <laughs> okay. So, but, and then when I, this whole linkage set up here, uh, I ended up having, making bushings, because the shafts were so worn, I had to replace one sh shaft. And uh, I tr more than tripled the bearing area when I put it back together on this engine. And then I also, somebody at, at 1404, they had put a, a gear, a swing starter, a Bosch uh, starter on it. And they had used a flywheel off of probably a ski do or something that used this obsolete hearth engine. And so it required that when I took it apart, I had to take the starter apart because the mounting flange on the starter was mounted on this side of the plate. <laughs> and the motor came up around. And it's, I'm going to change all of that and make it right. The other thing was that the the diamond frame in the front there was smaller than the ring gear. So you had to fish the thing in and out, and the ring gear then crippled the, it would interfere with these here. So they had cut those off and just welded them onto here and here on the other side. So the black one there is a frame, is a frame that my son just welded for me, and it's 30 millimeters wider on each side. So the ring gear will go through the new diamond, and so I just did a test fit on everything there. So. Neil. Yeah. Do you mix oil? In what ratio? Yeah. It's a, a 30 to one oil. Wow. So it's not the normal now 50 to 1, so it, it's, it's very rich in oil. So you don't run an injection pump or anything like that? Oh. I, I haven't run them yet. I'm going to make a test stand and uh, test run them before I put them on. One, one thing you might discover is that two strokes are much more sensitive to density altitude than four strokes. Okay. You are warned. Okay. <laughs> are, you, are you married to those original engines? There's nothing else that works well to do that, and it matches up with the the whole front of the airplane as a cant on the firewall, Ooh. and it has a, a pitch down. Okay, so pitch down is fine, but the cant means that. The propeller only goes one direction. <laughs> okay. you, you can't, uh, if you change an engine that goes the opposite direction, you got a problem, okay? And because it has a final, uh, it has a gearbox on the thing, it flips opposite most of them, okay? So, so none of the, the Bellini two strokes or any of the more modern engines that you might be able to use will work on that. The Polini is geared so mine. The Polini mind, except that I can't drive the the final drive for the feathering of the prop. No. You know, there was a fellow who I'm sure you were aware of it, but was taking a 14 putting a uh, four stroke was it a Zimbach or a No, Vortex? they put a they put a bigger earth in it. Bigger earth, okay. It's uh, it, um, it got ugly though. But it, it has huge cheeks on it. Yeah, it, it changed the whole look of the right. glider. It was so, beautiful glider that now looks yeah. terrible. So I'm in the process. I'm going to try to make it work with all, the, and especially this is this one's a, a owned by not just me but two others, and so I'm trying to make it get it into the air and for them. So I should have restored the wings and let them do the fuselage. <laughs> and then. 
the pedostatics were both falling out of the gliders. That's a new pedostatic from uh, winter. And uh, I've made it so that I can remove the whole cap, cap up there. And I'm going to put three PK screws on each side of this to hold it in place. And I'll accept the drag. <laughs> there was also a Weichel uh, version. There, yeah, one. That one. Was, yeah. It did look pretty cool, I thought. Yeah. So, anyway, I can talk more about that offline. I probably need to let go and let somebody get set up for the next one. Thank you. Good.